Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. So the title of the talk is 3264 Connex in a Second. So uh, I will explain the title. I will uh, tell you about the two pictures that you uh, see on the screen. And I hope to uh, take you on a tour from 19th century geometry to uh, current themes and then computing and data. So the left picture is also found in the, uh, whoops, in this uh, intergalactic version in the notices of the American Mathematical Society about a year ago in January 2020. And uh, there is an article in this issue of the notices called 3264 Connex in a second. So a good part of what I'll talk about today, you can read the verbatim in, in this article. So what is this picture about? So the picture is about conics in the plane. So let's start with the prehistory. So by a conic in the plane, I will mean the zero set of a polynomial in two variables, X and Y, that has degree two. So here, A, capital A is such a polynomial. You can see that there are six coefficients, A1, A2, and so on up to A6. These are real numbers. And uh, well, if I scale simultaneously scale the coefficients, then the zero set will be unchanged. So there are five degrees of freedom really in picking such a conic geometrically. Now let's say a second conic enters the scene called U, capital U with the uh, coefficients lowercase U1 up to U6. You can ask the question is what are the intersection points of the two conics? So, here in the picture, you see a blue circle, that's a conic. You see the, uh, the green ellipse, that's a conic. And you see four intersection points marked in red. Now, Bezu, 250 years ago, tells us that two conics will always intersect in four points in the complex projective plane. Or more generally, if you have two curves of a given degree in the, uh, in the plane, then the product of the degrees will be the expected number of intersection points. And here it's important that we work over the complex numbers, right? Because over the real numbers, typically the intersection points will be four, two, or zero. So for example, if I slide the green ellipse to the right a little bit, then the two left red points come together. There will be a, a tangency, a transition point at which uh, the two red points become complex. They're no, no longer visible in the real plane. And if I move the lips all the way to the right, the other two red points come together. And in the end, maybe I'm in a configuration with uh, four imaginary intersection points and no real points. So that's Bizu. And What's important here are these uh, transition points, uh, points of tangency. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about this. So points of tangency can be described algebraically by the vanishing of the Jacobian determinant. So an intersection point for our two conics will count with a higher multiplicity, two or more if it is a zero of another quadratic equation, which is the Jacobian determinant. So Jacobian is the, uh, the two by two determinant of the partial derivatives of our two quadrics. So this is a, a no, another quadratic polynomial. This coefficients now depend on the, the old coefficients as indicated. And then the conic U is tangent to the conic A if they exist a point at, at a point x, y, if this system of three quadratic equations in two unknowns is satisfied. So an over-constrained system of three equations in, in two variables. Now, of course, this statement is existentially quantified, right? We're saying there exist x and y. So if we want to eliminate these quantifiers and simply ask for the condition in terms of the six plus six, 12 coefficients for the, uh, the two conics, the, the blue and the green conic to be tangent. We get this by eliminating algebraically X and Y. And uh, this gives uh, an expression of degree 12. So it has degree six in the A's, it has degree six in the U's. 
And this is classically in the 19th century, this is known as the tact invariant of the two conics. So the tact invariant is a big polynomial that vanishes when the blue and the green conic are tangent. Now, is this a big polynomial? Well, that depends on your point of view, right? It goes on for a while. It has 3,210 terms. So to write, write it down by hand, it would be too big. But this is the day and age of big data. So in this day and age, in 2021, that's actually not a big polynomial. A polynomial with 3,210 terms of degree 12, the tact invariant is actually not such a big polynomial. Well, we'll come back to this polynomial in, in a moment. So this is the condition for two conics to be tangent. So here's the question we'll be interested in, and this is known as Steiner's conic problem. So Steiner, a geometer from around 1840, he asked the question, how many conics are tangent to five given conics? Suppose I draw five blue conics in the plane. So I'm fixing five conics. So here in this picture, there are four ellipses and, uh, and one hyperbola. Now ask the question, how many red conics are there that are tangent somewhere at each of the five given conics? Now, why is this a meaningful question? Well, there are five degrees of freedom to choose a red conic, right? There's the six coefficients up to scaling, so five degrees of freedom. Each tangency imposes one condition on the coefficients, on the red coefficients. Which condition? Well, this condition, right? So for fixed A, this is a condition of degree six in the unknown red coefficients U, right? So, uh, so we have uh, five degrees of freedom. We have five constraints. So we expect a finite number of solutions. And uh, indeed, uh, generally the number of solutions is finite. And Steiner proposes an answer in 1848. He says, Bezu's theorem gives the answer six times six times six times six times six, which is 7,776. So each tangency condition gives uh, an equation of degree six in the uh, five red parameters. And uh, Bezu's theorem in general says, if we have a, a system with the same number of equations as constraints, we should multiply the degrees. And this is what we did here. So that was Steiner's answer. Now, this answer due to Steiner turned out to be incorrect. So Steiner's answer, six to the fifth, was incorrect. And the reason is that Bezu's theorem does not apply in this situation. So this mistake was a, a very interesting mistake and it led to interesting historical developments in, in mathematics. And the reason Bezu's theorem does not apply is there's a surface of extraneous solutions, namely all the double lines will be tangent no matter what. So by a double line, I mean, uh, just a line of multiplicity two or algebraically the square of a linear equation. So if I have a linear polynomial, constant times X plus a constant times Y plus a constant, I square it. Then such a conic is called a double line. And then if you think about the Jacobian condition, the Jacobian will always vanish if uh, say U is a double line. So, uh, so any red double line will automatically be tangent to uh, the blue conics. And there is a surface worth of double lines. So those are extraneous solutions. Now this was fixed. Chalet in 1864 gave the correct answer. So there are 3,264 actual conics tangent in the sense we want. So so this surface of extraneous solutions cuts the uh, expected count roughly in half. Now this um, train of thought was further developed by Schubert who uh, published his book in 1879. And that led in the uh, turn of the last century uh, to Hilbert's 15th problem and the 20th century development in enumerative algebraic geometry and uh, intersection theory. There's a recent book by uh, David Eisenbutt and, and Joe Harris that has the number 3264 prominently in the title. So this is a, a very important number in the history of algebraic geometry because this mistake, uh, Steiner's mistake, 
really led us to understand how to do these kind of counts in, in a more systematic way. So what I'd like to do in the next 20 minutes, I'd like to combine two perspectives. So on the one hand, there's the enumerative algebraic geometry perspective. So this is the development started by Steiner, Schubert, and others, and culminating in the 20th century intersection theory. And the question is how many, say, conics are tangent to five general conics? So enumerative algebraic geometry, we're asking how many question, questions that are like how many, and then the answer is a positive integer. Now, more recently, recent is the development of numerical algebraic geometry. In a numerical algebraic geometry, we ask the question, how do we actually compute all the conics, right? So we don't just ask how many are there, but we want to list them, right? And in fact, we want to take your instance, and we want you, people in the audience, to draw five blue conics in the plane, and we ask, how can we, as fast as possible, compute all the red conics that are tangent to your given five blue conics. Now, how do we do this? Well, that's a few words about numerical algebraic geometry. So this question um, translates into a system of polynomial equations. So numerical algebraic geometry is about 40 years old now and concerns with numerical methods for reliably solving systems of polynomial equations. So how is this a system in our case? Well, uh, an instance, you're given five blue conics. Uh, you give me an instance by the uh, coefficients of your input, a1 up to a6, e1 up to e6. And then I formulate a system of five, or let's say six homogeneous, uh, five, uh, degree six equations and six homogeneous variables, namely the coefficients of this red conic. What are the equations? Well, the equations as you write down one tact invariant for each of the blue conics. So that's the system of algebraic equations we seek to solve. Now you can do this very, very, very conveniently. There is a web interface, the DIY interface for solving instances of Steiner's problem. So if you go to this website, Julia Homotopy Continuation Org DIY, then you and your children on the weekend, if they have nothing better to do, can play with this website. So on this website, you can choose your own instance of five conics. So you can, uh, it's a convenient interface for you to type the coefficients or, you know, let the system pick the coefficients for you. Then uh, you click the button, compute tangent conics. Now under the hood, the, uh, the website uh, calls a software called homotopycontinuation.jl. This is an open source Julia package written by Paul Breiding and Sasha Temme, who are my co-authors on the notices article. And then hopefully in a second or so, the, uh, the system comes back that all the complex solutions were found in about a second. And then it tells you more information. How many solutions are real of these? How many ellipses and hyperbolas and, and some other questions that you might have about the red answers. Then the picture will scroll. So this is a very convenient uh, web interface for you to play with. So if nothing else in this talk in the, uh, the remaining 39 minutes makes sense, so you can now go to uh, Steiner's problem, do it yourself and play with, with this interface. Now, of course, under the hood is uh, numerical algebraic geometry. There's homotopy continuation. And uh, if you like to apply this to your own polynomial system solving problem, then uh, you will actually have to, uh, to use this uh, Julia code. Julia is very, very convenient. It's a, a very modern interface for numerical uh, computing. I sometimes summarize it by saying that old people use MATLAB, young people use Julia. Well, let's get real. In polynomial system solving, when we apply this in uh, an applied context in engineering, data science, and so on, 
what we usually want is we don't want complex solutions, but we're interested in the real solutions, often maybe real positive solutions. So let's talk about real solutions to Steiner's conic problem. So one question you can ask, is there an instance of the five given blue conics such that all 3,264 complex solutions are actually real? So this was asked in the uh, 90s and answered in a paper by Ronga, Tonoli, and Wurst. They proved, the ex they gave a theoretical inconstructive proof for the existence of five real conics such that all the solutions are real. So again, there exists a choice of five blue conics in the plane such that all red complex solutions are actually real. Now their proof was inconstructive. So this raises the problem. Can you actually find an explicit instance? And I called the input A, B, C, D earlier such that all the solutions you are real. So we were able to, uh, to give such an instance, and here's the instance. Right? So here's the instance. These are my five conics. So then the rows are the coefficients. I make the constant term one in each case. And then the other five coefficients are these uh, reasonable rational numbers that you see on the screen. So I claim that if you pick those five quadratic equations, those five blue quadratic equations in X and Y, then all the red solutions will be real. And I'm going to tell you about the proof. But first, how was the instance found? Well, the instance was found using what's called the Pentagon construction. So the Pentagon construction says, well, let's assume that the five given conics are quite degenerate. Namely, each conic is a pair of lines. And it's a pair of lines that looks like a pair of chopsticks, um, almost parallel. So I, I look at a, I draw a pentagon in the plane. I pick a, a point on the relative interior of each edge of the pentagon. And then I arrange my chopsticks so that the crossing point is on this edge. Now with that degenerate configuration, I can ask what are the red convex tangent to this configuration? And well, that leads to an analysis of what does it mean for a red conic to be tangent? Well, there's sort of two possibilities, right? Either the uh, red conic can be just tangent to the line, right? And there's a certain multiplicity or it passes through the intersection point. So you can analyze uh, this situation and then you can make an argument that in this situation you expect 3,264 solutions all to be real. And uh, this instance is a numerical version of this. And at the website, uh, there's also a very nice animation that cycles you through all the 3,264 real solutions. So there's a picture that looks like the Pentagon and then uh, it, it scrolls through the, uh, the red conics. Let me throw in one slide on uh, a graduate school math. So most of the math so far was fairly elementary, but uh, how would you uh, derive the number 3,264 in a graduate class in algebraic geometry? Well, in a graduate class, you would argue by blowing up the exceptional locus, right? So we have the five-dimensional parameter space of conics. So that's a P5, a projective five space of conics with six homogeneous coordinates, U1, U2, U3, U4, U5, U6. There's the exceptional locus of the, uh, the surface of double lines. That's a uh, Veronese surface in this five space. And in this graduate class, you would argue by blowing up. The result of this blowing up is called the space of complete conics. That's a, another five dimensional manifold uh, of, uh, obtained uh, from P5. And we want to do some intersection theory or cohomology on that five dimensional space of complete conics. The Chow ring or cohomology ring of this uh, space of complete conics is generated by two special classes that I call P for point and L for line. So P is the class of all conics through a fixed point. That's a, 
a divisor, a co-dimension one set in the space of complete connex and L is dually all the connex that tangent to a fixed line. Now you can check that the following relations hold, right? So multiplication in the Chow ring or cohomology ring correspond to intersection of these, uh, of these sets. So P to the fifth here means you look at all the uh, connex that pass to five given points and there's one of them, right? So you draw five points in the plane, there's one conic tangent to it. So P to the fifth is one. The dual statement is if you draw five lines in the plane, there will be one conic tangent to the five lines. Now, if you ask for a conic passing through four points, tangent to one line, there'll be two of them. And then uh, passing through three points, tangent to two given lines, there'll be four. And then there's always a dual statement right, uh, on the duality between points and lines. So these are the six basic relations that hold between uh, the class P and the class L in the Chow ring. Now, what are we interested in? We're interested in the conics tangent to a given conic, right? And that's uh, another class. And I claim that class is 2L plus 2P. And, and the best way to actually see this is to simply look at the leading term of our tact invariant. Remember our tact invariant was this little small polynomial with 3,210 terms and six plus six unknowns. And then if you look at the leading monomial of that, you can read off that the degree is 2L plus 2P. Now then here's the conclusion. All you need to know is the binomial theorem, right? So once you have this expression, you raise it to the fifth power, right? Because you want to look at the class, you want to self-intersect this five times. So C to the fifth is the number of connects tangent to five given connects. So I pull out two to the fifth. So that's a 32 plus L plus uh, times L plus P to the fifth. Here's the binomial theorem for the fifth power. Then I substitute in these things. I get 32 times 102, and that's our number, three, two, six, four. So this is how the, uh, the number would be derived in a, in a modern geometry class. But this, as it stands, does not tell you how to compute the conics, but uh, that's what we're doing here. So it turns out the Pentagon construction in some sense is a geometric version of this argument in the Chow ring or cohomology. Now, when you run a numerical method for root finding, often you're using a version of an iterative method such as Newton's method. Let me talk for a moment about Newton's method for solving polynomial systems. Now, this is kind of an interesting story, even in one variable. So this picture, pertains to one degree three polynomial in one variable. So a cubic polynomial in one variable has three roots, a green root, a red root, and the blue root. And in the complex plane, they might be here and here and here. Right? Now you can see this fractal picture. So those are the, the regions, the basins of attraction of Newton's method. So Newton's method is an iterative method you learn in high school or an undergraduate for approximating the root. But if you color the complex plane in red, green, or blue, according to where you converge, which of the three roots you converge, you see very nice local behavior, but very chaotic global behavior. So locally, if you're near the root you're interested in, you have a very nice behavior, you have quadratic convergence, but the global dynamics is fractal-like and, and very complicated. I'm gonna say a point is an approximate zero of a polynomial system if there's a nearby true zero to which Newton's iteration converges quadratically. So an approximate zero typically will have rational coordinates, right? So the true zero will have a floating point. This will be a real or complex number, an algebraic number, but it won't be a rational number, right? But an approximate zero will be a floating point number. It will be a rational number. So a point with rational coordinates is an approximate zero if it satisfies this condition. Newton iteration converges quadratically from this point. 
Now, this sounds like an impossible condition to check, but it's actually checkable. And this leads to methods for certification. So we're going to say, again, the point is an approximate zero of a polynomial system. So now we have a system of n equations and n variables, or in our application, five equations and five variables. Then a point with rational coordinates is an approximate zero if there's a nearby zero to which Newton iteration converges quadratic. Now, it turns out that this condition can be verified in exact rational arithmetic. So until about a year ago, the state of the art of this was uh, Smales alpha theory, Stephen Smales alpha theory, and an implementation of this given by uh, Spatila and Hauenstein. And that's what we used in the original paper. In the meantime, there's a better version using an interval arithmetic. So so the state of the art of a posteriori uh, certification is this article by Briding, Rosa, and Timmer from November. And what's the input? Well, the input is a numerical solution found quick and dirty by any method whatsoever. So recall, a numerical solution has coordinates, real and complex coordinates that are floating point numbers, maybe eight digits or 12 digits. A floating point number is a rational number. So a numerical solution is some guess found somehow of points that you believe to be near the true solutions. The output of a posteriori certification is a symbolic proof that the given nearby solutions are in fact approximate solutions. And you can also use this to show that the instance is correct. So, uh, so using a state-of-the-art a posteriori certification, we uh, came up with a proof. This is a proof that this is a correct instance, that all the red conics that you see in the animation, animation are in fact correct. So I'd like to conclude um, this part of the talk by uh, summarizing that uh, computing is, is quite prevalent in algebraic geometry and nearby fields now, and commutative algebra, number theory. For many years, uh, purely symbolic methods, notably Gröbner bases, were the main engine for computing in algebraic geometry. Gröbner bases are great. They are very universal. Many, many problems can be phrased using Gröbner bases. But the big drawback of Gröbner bases is they tend to be very slow um, because the output is very, very large. So it's a common frustrating experience for users or your friends down the hall in the math department tell you, please try Gröbner bases on your problem. Well, then you have your problem, you type it in, you hit a button, you wait a minute, you wait an hour, you wait a day, and it just doesn't terminate on your instance. So this is not a fault of Gröbner bases, it's simply you're asking a symbolic question that is too hard. With today's numerical methods, one can go much further. One can uh, solve larger instances of uh, polynomial systems while retaining, and that's very important, while retaining reliability and certified proofs. So Gröbner bases, symbolic methods, of course, have the advantage that they're exact and certified. But uh, nowadays, uh, with uh, a posteriori certification, notably uh, with this article, if you have your polynomial system and, and you find approximate uh, zeros by some method, say in a second, using homotopy continuation in Julia, then a posteriori quite fast, you can give a proof that your numerical solution is correct. Maybe this is a good moment to, uh, to pause for a question. So I cannot see the chat. I can't see anybody. Oops. There are no questions in the chat right now, but maybe. I think I lost my, uh, no question in the chat. OK. So this either means that uh, everything is very clear and you understand my pictures, or it means it's completely incomprehensible. So I am hoping for the first. Please ask any questions. Be very happy to go back. Now, this lecture that you are listening to right now 
is this a pure math lecture or is this an applied math lecture? It's a little bit confusing, right? So on the one hand, the speaker talks about intersection theory and cohomology. That sounds like pure math. But then numerical methods and convergence of Newton iteration, that sounds like applied math. In fact, the uh, distinction doesn't make sense, right? So it's really the unity of math that is important. Um, there's now an activity group in algebraic geometry that's interested in, in this topic in the broadest possible sense. There's a SIEM journal on applied algebra and geometry that I'd like to invite you to. So SIEM, S-I-A-M, for the students in the audience is the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. And uh, so there's an active community where we're interested in, in, in particular in, in objects that can be described in polynomial. Uh, cryptography, here's the coma surface, tensors, uh, very important, geometric modeling, uh, applied topology, persistent homology, this is computer vision, robotics, optimization. So this is the title page of the journal. So I'd like to move on to the second part of this lecture. And the second part of the lecture is about LSSM, linear spaces of symmetric matrices. This is the logo, the LSSM logo. This is the Gaussian curve, the bell-shaped curve that you know from statistics and probability. These integers, this triangle of numbers, we call this the Schubert triangle, is uh, similar to 3, 2, 6, 4. But now the tangencies we're going to be interested in are tangencies in three-dimensional space. Let me explain these numbers. For example, the number 104. So let's say I'm giving you nine figures in three-dimensional space. And the figure is either a point, a line, or a plane. So here in the blue diagram, I give you three blue points. I give you, uh, I'm sorry, three red points, three blue planes, and three black lines. So three points, three lines, and three planes. And now we're asking the question, how many quadratic surfaces? So in one high dimension, how many quadratic surfaces are tangent to the nine given figures? Now, for quadratic surfaces in three space, we have nine degrees of freedom because uh, a quadratic polynomial in x, y, and z has 10 coefficients. So there are nine degrees of freedom of picking a sphere or American football or European football in three dimensional space. So tangency means that the, uh, the quadratic surface passes through the three red given points that is tangent to the three black lines and a tangent to the three blue planes. And the answer is 104. Right? So this is uh, kind of the analog to uh, the tangency in the Pentagon picture we saw in the plane earlier. 128 is what you get if the figures are two red points, five black lines, and two blue um, planes. And then this triangle gives you all the possibility of picking nine figures where each figure is a point, a line, or a plane. So what is LSSM about? Well, let's talk about applied topics. So in particular, optimization and statistics. I'm going to write SN for the space of real symmetric n by n matrices. That's a real vector space of dimension n plus 1 choose 2. In this vector space, we have a convex cone, a closed convex cone of positive semi-definite matrices, and I call this Sn plus. Recall the greatest miracle from your linear algebra class. The greatest miracle says that a real symmetric matrix has all of its eigenvalues real. That is a miracle known as the spectral theorem. So all the eigenvalues of a real symmetric matrix are real. And if all the eigenvalues are positive, or let's say non-negative, then we call the matrix positive semi-definite. So Sn plus is the open cone of positive definite matrices. This cone is convex, right? If I have 
a positive definite matrix and you have a positive definite matrix, then the sum of our matrices is also convex. Now, positive definite matrices are very important in statistics. They are the covariance matrices of some distribution on Rn and optimization they arise in semi-definite programs. Now let's give ourselves a linear space of symmetric matrices, an LSSM. So let's give ourselves a linear space of dimension M inside this vector space and look at the intersection of the cone with the linear space. Now if the intersection with the open cone is non-empty, then that convex cone will be a convex cone of dimension M. Now it's convenient for drawing this to slice with an affine hyperplane, and then you get a convex body of dimension M minus one. And what you see is the picture that we saw at the beginning of the talk. This illustrates the case N equals three, M equals four. So the yellow convex body, this is known as the elliptope or samosa, samosa being the thing that you eat in an Indian restaurant. So this is a puffed up tetrahedron. So imagine taking a yellow tetrahedron, puffing some air into it. So you still have the four corners, the vertices of the tetrahedron is still retain the six edges in the boundary, but the triangular faces are fattened up and you get this uh, elliptope or samosa. Now, why does this illustrate our case? Right, so if n is three, we have the uh, six dimensional ambient space of symmetric matrices. Inside this six dimensional space, we have the six dimensional ice cream cone of positive definite matrices. Then we pick a linear space L of dimension four. So I'm cutting my six dimensional cone with a four dimensional linear space that makes a four dimensional cone. And then drawing the picture, I get the three dimensional convex body. Now the boundary of this convex body is a cubic surface. So this picture really is a, a cubic surface because the determinant of a symmetric three by three matrix is a cubic polynomial. This is a singular cubic surface in three space. It has four singular points. It's known as Cayley cubic surface or the Cayley symmetroid. In red, the red elephant ears is the rest of the cubic surface. It's the uh, Zariski closure of the yellow boundary. So if you draw all the zeros of the uh, three by three determinant restricted to L, L being a projective three space, then you get the, the red yellow picture. And if you are in the audience and you're a number theorist or geometer, you might wonder where are the 27 lines and a hint is they come in uh, they come in three clusters of nine. Okay, so there are nine triple lines on this particular singular surface. But back to applied math. Now, in optimization, these yellow convex bodies are spectrohedra. So a spectrohedron is an intersection of the cone of positive definite matrices with an affine linear space, and we're very interested in optimizing a linear function on this yellow spectrohedron, especially if we're at CWI in Amsterdam. Now, semi-definite programming generalizes linear programming, right? So if L happens to be a linear space of diagonal matrices, then we recover linear programming. So a good definition for linear programming is linear programming is semi-definite programming for diagonal matrices. Or put the other way around, semi-definite programming is the non-abelian version of linear programming, right? Because diagonal matrices multiply in an abelian way and general matrices don't. Now in statistics, we're imposing linear constraints on either the covariance matrix or its inverse, the concentration matrix. So these are called linear Gaussian models. So, so this colorful picture either represents spectrohedra in optimization or linear models in Gaussian statistics. So here are the uh, two optimization problems this leads to. So semi-definite programming, as I said, minimize a linear function over a spectrohedron. Linear function in matrix space can be written as the trace of the matrix product. 
And in statistics, a typical problem is maximum likelihood estimation. So we summarize the data now in the matrix S, the sample covariance matrix, the likelihood function on the uh, space of symmetric matrices is the log of the determinant minus the trace. And then this is a function we're maximizing over the cone. So here we are minimizing over the convex body. Here we're maximizing this function over the cone. And here this uh, three ellipse illustrates semi-definite programming. And then this clustering problem for a mixture of three Gaussians uh, illustrates the, the maximum likelihood problem. We did hear quite a bit about AI and data science. The previous section, the session I found quite interesting actually, there was a parallel session. One session was a very nice discussion of uh, marrying PDE models with, uh, with data science and deep learning. And the parallel session, there was a more historical, a societal discussion about the the impact on political ramifications of AI. So AI and data science is in everybody's mind. Optimization is an ingredient. And here are two optimization problems that, that are pertinent. Now, what about algebraic geometry, right? So what can we say about uh, points in our cone, quadratic forms? Well, in algebraic geometry, a symmetric matrix of size n by n really represents a quadratic surface, hypersurface and projective n minus one space. So, so the quadrics in the plane that we saw in the first part of the talk, those are symmetric three by three matrices. So here in blue, we have a blue, sorry, three by three. They say blue symmetric three by three matrix. In green, we have a symmetric three by three matrix and the figures intersect in four points. Now, if you take two symmetric four by four matrices, then you're intersecting two quadratic surfaces in three space. So they intersect along a degree four curve, an elliptic curve. And you can generalize, it can ask, what about, uh, let's say five by five symmetric matrices or six by six symmetric matrices. For example, if you intersect three quadrics in P4, um, that's a very nice uh, canonical curve of genus four and P5, you get a del Pezzo surface and so on. So a question a geometer would ask is how many quadrics are tangent to nine given quadrics? So this is exactly the question we had before in the plane, the answer was three, two, six, four, but things are more interesting in higher dimensions. So if you do the analog in three space, already Schubert knew the answer. So the number of quadratic surfaces tangent to nine given blue quadratic surface in three space is 666,841,088. Now that's a polynomial system with lots of solutions, 600 million solutions, but it is not too bad. The future is numerical. The future of the interface of numerics, data science and algebraic geometry will enable us to reliably find all these solutions. This is copied uh, from Schubert's book, 1879 book. So he here gives the, uh, the binomial expansion that I showed for the plane. So this is the calculation in the Chow ring or cohomology ring of the space complete quadrics now for four by four matrices. And he says, well, you substitute in all the symbols into the previous expression, then finally you get the answer, 666,841,088. And of course, Schubert was correct. Now what we'd like to do with our optimization problems, the semi-definite programming problem and the maximum likely ex explanation problem, we would like ideally to perform exact computations we would like to reliably, provably get answers. To get to those reliable, provable, certifiable answer, we need to know the algebraic degree of these optimization problems. So what do I mean by algebraic degree? Well, the data, the input to the optimization problem is matrices. So L is a linear space of symmetric matrices may be given by a basis. S is an additional symmetric matrix maybe the sample covariance matrix in the statistical setting. 
these matrices have rational entries. These matrices have rational entries. You might not think that. You might think there's uncertainty, there are floating point numbers. If you send me those matrices by email, your matrices have rational entries, right? Now, that being so, the optimal solution to these problems will have coordinates that are algebraic numbers, right? They're real numbers, but they are algebraic. They satisfy, the coordinates satisfy a polynomial with integer coefficients. So we can therefore ask, what is the intrinsic degree of the field extension? What's the intrinsic complexity of those numbers? What is the degree of that field extension over Q for, let's say, general data? So this is the algebraic degree of the optimization problem. This algebraic degree comes with the Galois group. And again, this is the intrinsic algebraic complexity of solving your optimization problem for your rational data, irrespective of method used. Okay. So that's the paradigm that we like to think about. Now, LSSM, the acronym for linear spaces of symmetric matrices is also the acronym of a project. Now that project was inspired by recent product progress due to Michalek, Moni, and Wisniewski on uh, maximum likelihood degrees. So it was open for a while, uh, what these degrees should be in general. And they uh, just published a, a beautiful paper where, where they gave an answer and that spurred a lot of further research. And then after their preprint came out, the pandemic struck. Last year in March, April, well, we didn't know quite how to continue, say, with our group at Leipzig. And so I put together a problem list for graduate students and postdocs to sort of find a common theme that in spite of being separated and unable to meet in person, we could maybe have a common theme. And my problem list had the title 3,264 questions on symmetric matrices. Now that became the, uh, the LSSM project. So this was a collaboration project that uh, people at the Max Planck Institute and worldwide contributed. Um, this led us leading now to a, a special volume with research papers in this Italian journal, the Le Mathematiche. Um, well, we collected papers in the fall, right? The articles were submitted. And there's now a bunch of wonderful articles on symmetric matrices, all inspired by this theme, by these numbers, 3264. And if you want to be more challenging, 666,841,088. In the last uh, seven, eight minutes, uh, I'd like to tell you just a little bit uh, but some of the articles, so these are three articles that, that I'm a co-author on with students. Uh, so first one we submitted in September. So Claudia is a student in Leipzig, Jelena is a student in Berkeley. Uh, and the second one, Arthur is a postdoc, he's Dutch. He uh, came originally from Eindhoven and Jan Dreismas group. Uh, Henrik is a, a student, a numerical analysis student in Leipzig. And then Taylor is a postdoc, and then Claudia again. So we can talk about tangent quadrics and real three space. So these numbers I already explained. So now I have nine figures in three space. But in these pictures, I allow four kinds of figures points, lines, planes, and quadratic surfaces. So here I fix two delta equals two quadratic surfaces. And then otherwise, uh, points, lines, and planes, say uh, two points, two two planes and uh, three lines. And then there are 3,712 uh, quadratic surfaces tangent to those nine figures. So this, this array of triangles, so we pile up these triangles for delta equals zero or delta equal one, we call the Schubert pyramid. So at the bottom of the Schubert pyramid, you have the previous triangle. And at the top of Schubert's pyramid, you have the 666 million from Schubert's book. So the article with uh, Jelena and Claudia deals with uh, surfaces in particular, but uh, also we uh, do something with likelihood geometry. So maybe a few words about this. So a subspace in LSSM is a point in the Grassmannian. So the Grassmannian of M-dimensional 
vector subspaces in the n plus one choose two dimensional space of symmetric matrices. We focus on regular linear spaces, those that contain at least one invertible matrix, so a typical matrix in the subspace invertible. For such a regular L, it's very interesting to study the reciprocal variety. So the reciprocal variety is the set of all matrix inverses for every matrix X in the linear space. You have a linear space of matrices. The typical matrix is invertible. You invert it, then you take the set of all of these inverses and you close them up. And this becomes a projective variety in the n plus one choose two minus one dimensional projective space. And we're interested in basic invariance, equations, degrees, singularities, and so on. Now this is relevant for statistics because we're imposing in statistics linear constraints on either the covariance matrix or the concentration matrix of a Gaussian model. The corresponding algebraic degrees, there's the ML degree, the maximum likelihood degree is the number of complex critical points of the likelihood function L. And then the reciprocal ML degree is the number of complex critical points on the likelihood function of L inverse. Um, both of these uh, are independent of the sample covariance matrix, if that is generic, and they're invariant, of course, under the natural action of GLN on symmetric matrices. It's known that the ML degree is bounded above by the degree of our projective variety, equality holds for generic L, and we also have formulas in the paper for the reciprocal ML degree. And this is, uh, ties in to the tangency conditions because the, uh, these numbers in the generic case are exactly given by the first row in our Schubert triangle. So the first row being the situation when every figure is either a point or a plane. We wrap up. So this is the paper with the Bick and Eisenbahn on Jordan algebras of symmetric matrices. So, so my last point on symmetric matrices is the question, how do you multiply them? How should you multiply two symmetric matrices? Now trouble is, if you naively multiply two symmetric matrices, the result is not a symmetric matrix. Right? You would like to multiply symmetric matrices in such a fashion that the result is a symmetric matrix again. And you can do this as follows. So let's fix an invertible matrix U. And then I can define the product of X and Y to be the average of X U inverse Y and Y U inverse X. Right? So this defines an algebra structure on the space of symmetric matrices. And U plays the role of the unit in this algebra structure. Now, if we take U to be the identity matrix, which we may, then this is simply the average of X, Y, and Y, X. So this is the, uh, and this uh, is again a symmetric matrix. So this is a way of multiplying two symmetric matrices and making another symmetric matrix. We drop the subscript at the bullet if U is understood. So the product, now this product is bilinear, it's commutative, and U is the unit. Now it's commutative, but it's not associative. So associativity fails, but it almost holds, right? So there's a weak version of associativity, namely X times X times X times Y is the same as X times X times X times Y. And this is the axiom for a Jordan algebra. So Jordan algebra is an algebraic structure that satisfies this weird axiom. So so if you think Lie algebras are weird, well, Jordan algebras are even weird. Right? Now, who cares? Who would care about Jordan algebras and who would care about multiplying symmetric matrices in this weird fashion? Well, people do. People in physics do, people in statistics do, and people in optimization do. So here are just uh, some references. So back in the 30s, when the math mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics were laid, uh, Jordan, Van Neumann, and Wigner published a joint paper where they introduced Jordan algebra. So, so Jordan algebras were uh, introduced in 1934 in this paper on the algebraic generalization of the quantum mechanical formulas. 
Now they popped up in statistics. So here's a reference to the annals of statistics from the 80s. And uh, so there they uh, play a role as we'll see in a moment for covariance hypotheses that are linear in both the co covariance matrix and the inverse covariance matrix. So we mentioned already the in inversion on, on LSSMs. So this is very pertinent in statistics where you have natural constraints, both on covariance matrix and concentration matrix. In optimization, there is work of Perillo and Parameter from last year. Uh, Jordan algebra is a very important uh, to exploit symmetry and, and dimension reduction in a semi-definite program via Jordan algebra. So, so this seemingly weird axiom of a Jordan algebra, the seemingly weird way of multiplying two matrices are actually important in a, a wide range of blue contexts. One theorem from our paper. So uh, if L is a, a linear space of symmetric matrices and U is an invertible matrix, then the following three conditions are equivalent. The reciprocal variety is again a linear space. L is a Jordan algebra inside Sn. And if that holds, then L inverse actually equal to L up to congruence. So to be precise, we have this relation. It's not so easy on first glance to check whether this is the case. So for example, here is a two LSSMs with M and N are four. So these are four-dimensional linear spaces of symmetric four by four matrices. So each of these uh, represents a four-dimensional space. So the right one with the minus here satisfies this. It's a Jordan algebra. So the inverse, the inverses are again a linear space. And this one is not a Jordan algebra. Okay. Time is up. I promise to be done in time. So well, the list of questions from last May did not have 3,064 entries at only 65. So there's still 3199 questions out there for you to find and to work on. And uh, let me end again on this intergalactic picture showing the conics tangent to 6, 5 given conics. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>